We're talking about the Jason Collins story this week with Mary Curtis. She's a contributor to the Washington Post She the People blog. Democratic State Senator Kelvin Atkinson of Nevada, who just came out last month on the Senate floor during the debate on gay marriage. Former NBA player John Amici and Mike Pesca, sports reporter at NPR. And Kelvin, by the way, I said Nevada. I always get a lot of flack from people for saying Nevada, so I'm going to say <laughs> Nevada from, from here on in. Um, I, I guess I want to lead it off by playing some, uh, some sound from, from President Obama this week, who was asked about Jason Collins and, and had this to say. I'll say something about Jason Collins. I had a chance to, to talk to him yesterday. Uh, he's, he seems like a terrific young man. And uh, yeah, I told him I couldn't be prouder. Uh, you know, one of the a, a extraordinary uh, measures of progress that we've seen in this country uh, has been uh, the recognition that uh, the LGBT community deserves uh, full equality, not just partial equality, uh, not just uh, tolerance, but uh, a recognition that they're fully a part of the American family. So, I mean, obviously, it's great to see the president, you know, being supportive of him like that. But a couple things struck me about that. One, you know, he went out of his way to answer that question. He's leaving the room. He wanted to answer it, came back. Um, he had personally called Jason Collins. Um, and, of course, this came on the heels of in, in, in President Obama's uh, inaugural address back in January. He, he specifically invoked Stonewall riots, sort of this, this um, iconic moment for the, for the gay rights movement in America. Um, it strikes me that, that in politics, how much has changed so quickly, really in the last year? Because if we were having this conversation a year ago, if Jason Collins had come out a year ago, that would have been back when President Obama did not support gay marriage, when he was still evolving on the question, when I think the calculus of the president and a lot of other politicians in his own party and, and, and everywhere was, we have to keep a certain amount of distance from this issue. And what I really thought I was seeing this week was that distance is just completely melting away. Yeah, or when he said he didn't support it, right? Because right. it seems apparent now, if you look at the reaction, I think a lot of us thought, well, this shouldn't be a huge issue, but I'm sure we'll see a lot of negativity. There wasn't a lot, at least officially phrased negativity. It got to the point where we were so, uh, as a culture, as a, or the NBA establishment, or people who wanted to, to defend Jason Collins, were so eager to jump on anyone who said anything wrong that they were pulling out people from you know pretty obscure places who said, boo about Jason Collins' reaction and condemning them. And I think what we saw out of uh, uh, the president shows not just how much we've changed in the last year. Remember in 2004, you know, the Bush uh, administration put a lot of gay ballot measures on, on the uh, ballots in Ohio. And I don't see that that stuff plays. I began this week to question the entire idea of the culture war. I don't know if it's over or if it was just overblown. Of course, it's, I mean, it's certainly evolved in a big way. I mean, Kelvin, you just lived it in Nevada. Absolutely. Um, you know, going back, we did that too. I mean, in 2000 and 2002, uh, there were a lot of measures um, uh, looking to ban marriage um, and uh, marriage equality um, in Nevada. And now here we are, 2013, and actually reversing it or down the road to reversing it. The Senate passed it in Nevada, um, and now it's in the House. And so, um, so we are looking at a huge ch shift as well. The political calculation really has changed. You see, it. I'm based in North Carolina, and just last year, they had the amendment to the state constitution, which reaffirmed the only domestic legal union being marriage between a man and a woman. And then you just had this year Senator Kay Hagan, who's a Democrat who's going to be having a pretty tough re-election race next year, come out for same-sex marriage. I think realizing that the political calculation has changed, and it will probably help her in the state, particularly among the grassroots. Well, you know, Mike, you, you you talk about how maybe the culture wars are over a little bit, and, and um, one thing that struck me this week when, within the sports world was there was a comment I kept hearing repeated over and over again um, that it wasn't hostile mm -hmm. to, to Jason Collins. It wasn't overtly hostile to Jason Collins, but it was. I, I noticed a number of prominent commentators going out of their way to say, I don't know why we're talking about this. I don't care at all. And I think there are a couple different readings on this. I want to play an example of this. This is Mike Francesa, who's a... a Sports talk radio host here in New York. He used to work for CBS. He's a big time, big timer in the sports world. Let's let's play him. Now we have a player in Jason Collins, who has been a you know a journeyman player in the NBA. Now admitting, as he looks to stay in the league, and now if he doesn't stay in the league, it'll all be considered that he's been run out of the league. But admitting now that or at least now coming forward with the fact that he is homosexual. Why? I have no idea. 
I guess I'll have to read the story. I, I, I guess I will when I get a chance. I mean, I have, I, I have the story here. I have no, I'm not compelled to run and talk about it or read it. I really don't care. I have something to say about this, and I want to get my guest's reaction, and I want time to do it, so we'll do it right after this. <laughs> All right, we just heard from Mike Francesa this week on radio here in New York, sports radio host, and he's basically making the, I don't, I don't want to talk about this. I, you know, and, and I, there were a couple different readings on that. You know, t- the, the charitable one is this is where we should be, right? This shouldn't be an issue. This shouldn't be something that anybody has to talk about. The other issue, though, and I, I, I cannot remember who wrote this, but I saw a really good column on this this week, somebody who basically said this is the new way for people right now who, who used to say, I don't like this. I don't want this you know, around me. Now to say that, that, that sort of the, the where political correctness is, it's kind of moved to this is what you have to say to not be excoriated by the public. That column was written by Josh Levine of Slate, who I okay. co-host the podcast <laughs> with, a friend of mine. And yeah, that's the new thing. And why you have to put it in my face? And it's a total, it might be ignorant. Maybe if you said a few things to people who say that, they might say, oh yeah, I never thought that. There's a huge difference between the de facto assumptions of a heterosexual world and what it means to be homosexual. But what I heard Mike Francesa saying there just speaks to demographics. He's in his 60s. He's uncomfortable with it. And I don't think we should necessarily jump down the throats of people right. who express an honest, be honestly being uncomfortable with it. The average age in the NBA is 26.7. And I think that's why we see a lot of the NBA players really saying not only don't I don't care about uh, homosexuality, but I would support a teammate who are homosexual. I actually think it's more damning to suggest that he talks like this because he's old than it is the truth, than to say the truth, which is that uh, this is a translation, a, a, a passing off of the language of, of I don't like this into a different thing. Uh, you know, the idea that somehow old people, <laughs> older people don't, can't keep up with the times, can't accept their grandchildren, etc., is just a nonsense. He, he simply is refusing. He's a dinosaur who refuses to evolve. Although we, I mean, we enough. do see, like, the, the, the polling, I've never seen polling that's so sort of generationally stark when you ask, like, about gay marriage. And it's now, I mean, like 70, 80 yeah. percent for young people now. And it's still, to the extent there's widespread opposition, it still is, you know, a gener. It's not to, not to you know, say the whole generation is, is bigoted or something. It just, it, there does seem yeah. to be a real generation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute the, the, the difference in, in the polling. I would simply say that that we have to really question is it it's simply the fact that people are digging their heels in as opposed to just learning because you, right now there, there are older people who are using iPads and, and iPods and all kinds of technology the idea that these people cannot come up with the times is not the truth the idea that they may be resistant to it I, I give that but well, his language is transparent the, 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 the other issue that, that Jason Collins raised we, we had those the 12 words there you know I am gay get all the attention I am black was was also part of this, um, and he talked about you know being raised first of all being being raised in a in a religious family as well. Um, but you know, Kelvin, maybe maybe you could speak to this a little bit. There's yeah. there's a sort of a particular struggle there uh, within the black community being gay. It, it's a huge struggle. I think the black community is probably one of the the last uh, communities to embrace it. Um, and I use those same terms, um, but I use them before Jason Collins. Um, <laughs> but it but it is. It, I mean, it, and it wasn't necessarily the calling the attention to on black. I think it was just. Um, um, dealing with the fact that we have dealt with so much and now this is something else and now this is something else the black community is one of the last to embrace while every other community has already begun to embrace it um, we're kind of late at the table and you know as John said earlier um, and, well I, I'll have to go back and say that I do um, find more of a um, age um, differences with accepting it because uh, older African Americans are, are really really um, not as uh, as accepting. I do think that there's a nuanced view about that. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, many African Americans look at the civil rights struggle. Absolutely. In his own uh, column in Sports Illustrated, he talks about his grandmother being afraid that he is going to uh, uh, have people attack him because of that, because she has seen that. And also, I think, to give the black community credit, you can't say the black community, but uh, many people felt that Obama's support of same-sex marriage would hurt, hurt him in the vote. And you saw a lot of folks said, no, not really. We may have some disagreements with him on some issues. Uh, and even places where they have been re- referendums on same-sex marriage, uh, there have been a nuanced view. Even some black ministers saying, you know what, maybe I wouldn't marry a man and a man or a woman and a woman in my church, but this is an issue of discrimination, and I cannot be for something that would be discriminating against any group. So I think, and many black homosexuals, of course, live in the black community, so they're dealing with things every day, and I don't think they feel shunned in certain ways. So I think it's simplistic to say black folks are homophobic. 
Yeah, no, and, and it should be noted, like last year after President Obama, you know, completed his evolution on, on, on gay marriage, um, there was a ballot initiative in Maryland, which has a large black population. It's almost like I think 30 percent in the state. Um, and public opinion uh, among black voters in Maryland swung dramatically in the wake of that. And it, and it seemed almost like it was a moment, not necessarily just following President Obama's lead, but to say that the issue was really, they were forced to confront the issue more directly maybe than they had been before. I think people want to be decent. And I think people want to believe that history bends towards justice and I think maybe someone of an older generation or maybe the black community there's more baggage to overcome how much of the messaging that people who grew up with in the 50s or 60s about homosexuality being deviant doesn't exist with the Millennials where you know people under 32 74 percent accept homosexuality so that's a huge generational difference and I probably difference within the culture too. people when when if you've never been told that this was bad or if you have a lot of messages that people are people you're very willing to accept a gay teammate a gay person a gay politician there's there's one other issue I, I do want to get to here as well because Jason Collins also talks about being a Christian and I know in the sports world um, Christianity plays a very large uh, role and I, I want to ask a little bit about how Christianity and, and the religion of many of his teammates will mix with his revelation this week we'll talk about that after this so I did want to get into to Christianity a little bit here because, I mean, anybody who's ever watched I mean, I, the, the scene at the end of a, a football game, an NFL football game, where you'll have dozens of players gather around midfield, get down on a knee, and pray together. Um, you know, uh, Christianity is a, is a big part of sports culture. Um, it's got to, I assume, you know, it's going to be represented in, in, in every locker room um, that Jason Collins has ever been in and that he'll ever be in. Um, I sort of wonder how those two things are going to mix. I think it's difficult uh, because a lot of Christians don't recognize the kind of um, hyperbolic Christianity that happens in sports. They, they don't see that as real because it's inconsistent. It, it, you, you look at some of the Jason Collins' teammates and, and just in sports in general, uh, he's not the distraction. They are. I, I sat in locker rooms with people talking to me about how homosexuality is disgusting while telling me about the two women they slept with last night who weren't their wife. So for me, I'm interested in consistency of conviction. So for people like Chris Boussard and others who have made statements, it's not that I don't think they should be allowed to have an opinion. It's the idea that where was your outrage at the gambling, at the, the, the man who beat up his partner, at all these other events that we could rattle off and run in a line below us? Where is the outrage there and why now at this time? That it's consistency of conviction, and, and surely, if you're a Christian, that's what it should be all about. Not cherry-picking bits from the Old Testament to suit your particular uh, quibbles. And that's a great point, and I've heard that a lot uh, over the last two weeks as well. Uh, why do we choose one, you know, as some folks say, sin, uh, to focus or hone in on when there are so many other things going on? And so why do we choose one uh, to demonize folks over, um, let people live their lives? Um, and so it is this whole Christianity thing, but also Christianity teaches us that we shouldn't judge. And so it, it's kind of a mixed pot, but, uh, but one that will we'll continue even after this discussion. And also anyone with an ounce of Christian or whatever feeling, you can look at that article in Sports Illustrated and see the toll it took for him to hide and to keep his true self from the people he loved, from his twin brother. He was engaged. And you see when he can talk about the person he is, how he's free, how he's relaxed. He is his true self. He can be honest. How can you not be moved by that if you say you have an ounce of Christian feeling? And and people have said, uh, real quick, people have said that even to me the last two weeks, gosh, you seem so much happier. And I didn't notice that there was a huge mm -hmm. difference in me, but other people have. And, you know, again, if you're Christian, how do you not embrace that? Well, it does. It, it, you know, there was a, a poll now, it's probably two years old, but I remember it jumped out at me. It surveyed attitudes on, on gay marriage among evangelical Christians. And that generational thing we were talking about earlier, you could see it there, too. When you talked about evangelical Christians over 50, there may have been one person in the country that I, I wanted, but when you talked to evangelicals age 18 to 29, the stat stuck with me, 44%. 44% said they support gay marriage. So you're, you're even seeing you know, real generational movement there. So maybe that'll be reflected in sports. Um, anyway, so what do we know now that we didn't know last week? My answer's after this. <laughs>
In just a moment, what we now know that we didn't know last week. But first, a quick update on two stories we told you about last weekend. In North Carolina, where Republicans have taken control of the governorship and both houses of the legislature for the first time since Reconstruction, the GOP is advancing a number of hardline proposals, including a requirement for residents to show photo ID at the polls. The bill has already passed the State House and appears likely to become law. On this program last Sunday, Reverend William Barber, the head of the North Carolina chapter of the NAACP, announced plans to protest the voter ID bill at the state legislative building. The next day, protesters led by Barber held a prey in there. After ignoring demands to disperse, 17 of the demonstrators were, were arrested and taken away in handcuffs, including Reverend Barber. They were all released the next morning on a $1,000 bond each and have been charged with second-degree trespassing and other related infractions. Last week, we also told you about a hunger strike by detainees at Guantanamo Bay. More than 100 are now refusing to eat and could soon starve to death. Some of the detainees have been held at the prison as so-called enemy combatants without trial for more than a decade. President Obama was asked about the hunger strike at the White House on Tuesday and reiterated his call to close the prison. It lessens cooperation with our allies on counterterrorism efforts. It is a recruitment tool for extremists. It needs to be closed. So far, Congress has blocked the president's attempts to do just that, and there are no signs that congressional leaders have changed their minds. So what do we now know that we didn't know last week? Uh, we know that President... Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Screwed this one up. My first major flub on the air. Uh, one more thing. What do, we now, what do we know now that we didn't know last week? Let's start that over. We now know that President Obama supports the FDA's recent decision to make Plan B one step, commonly known as the morning after pill, available over the counter to women and girls 15 years and older. At a press conference on Thursday, Obama said, quote, I'm very comfortable with the decision they've made right now based on solid scientific evidence. While this decision and the president's support is a positive step for reproductive rights, we know that just a, we know that just a day before the Obama administration announced they would appeal a federal court's order that the FDA provide emergency over-the-counter contraception to women and girls of any age, a decision that was, it was also based on solid scientific evidence. The ruling dates back to an unprecedented and clearly political move by the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services during the 2012 presidential campaign, where they blocked the FDA from allowing women under 17 from getting emergency contraception without a prescription. We know the morning after pill has been found to be safe for women of all ages, and that if the president is serious about making policy decisions based on science and facts, then he should not make exceptions for political convenience. We now know that the fight for real filibuster reform is not over. Facing unprecedented obstruction from the GOP, Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley, a champion of reform, is proposing legislation that would force filibustering senators to speak on the floor, as Senator Rand Paul did with drones recently. Merkley has joined with the grassroots group Democracy for America and launched an online petition called Reform the Filibuster. The renewed fight comes after a January bill championed by Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell made just modest adjustments to filibuster rules, which have unsurprisingly done little to end unnecessary gridlock. Gr gridlock. We know that a minority party has the right to oppose legislation, but when it repeatedly blocks the will of the public and a majority of senators, then at the very least, they should have to tell the American people why. And finally, we now know that April was the deadliest month in Iraq in nearly five years. The UN mission to Iraq said says that in April, 712 people were killed and 1,633 were wounded, most of whom were civilians. We know that sectarian violence is increasing across Iraq and igniting fears of a civil war. We know that as the drumbeat for American intervention in Syria gets louder, we should consider the reality of Iraq today, because wars don't just end when our troops come home. Now I want to find out what my guests know that they didn't know when the week began. Survive that screw up barely. Mary, we'll start with you. What do we know? Well, if we didn't know it already, North Carolina is the center of the political universe. On Monday, you had Charlotte Mayor Anthony Fox nominated to be Transportation Secretary. Congressman Mel Watt has been nominated to head the Federal Housing Finance Agency. You had Governor Pat McCrory, who featured in your segment, is delivering the Republican address this week, and there is pushback in the state. So just because we have some great competition from South Carolina with that race coming up this week with Mark Sanford and Elizabeth 
with Colbert Bush, uh, America, uh, North Carolina hasn't given up its spot in the its place in the spotlight. We forgot to say that he's North Carolina resident, <laughs> Harry Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> what do we know? We didn't know last week um, in Nevada is that uh, this marriage equality issue is going to continue, um, and that we have a lot of work to do. Um, that it is going to our lower house, and that uh, we have to support it, and that it'll be coming back um, in 2015 uh, to the legislature for us to pass again before it goes to voters. Um, and I think that we, we learned that uh, our, stat, our state is progressing. What we know is that the stereotypes that exist around identity, something we probably should have known before this, that can be blown out of the water by an individual. Jason Collins has managed to do that. His eloquence, his thoughtfulness, uh, are the antithesis of what people think about a lot of black people uh, and certainly um, he isn't the pick the poster of what you would think of for a gay person I think it's really good to have these people that blow these boxes out of the water well, we've been talking about tall people. I'd like for a second, I'm sitting next to one. I'd like to for a second talk about tall buildings because this week the number one World Trade Center was topped. That was used to be called the Freedom Tower and it's topped by a spire. Only it's a spire that functions as an antenna and looks like an antenna, but it's sort of this architectural platypus. Why isn't it an antenna? And here's the reason. If it's an antenna, the 1776 foot height is not official. If it's an antenna, the Committee on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats will not consider that an official height. So this is why you have to call it a spire and not an antenna. I'd watch the people from Chicago trying to call it an antenna because they want the Sears Tower, now the Willis Tower, to maintain the status as the tallest building in the United States. This spire versus antenna issue will not go away. I can hear them working on that spire in Chicago <laughs> right now for the Sears Tower. I want to thank Mary Curtis from the Washington Post, Nevada Democratic State Senator Kelvin Atkinson, former NBA player John Amici, and Mike Pesca of NPR. Thanks for getting up, and thank you for joining us today for Up. Join us tomorrow, Sunday morning at 8, when we'll look at the GOP's latest hope for 2016, Senator Ted Cruz. And coming up next is Melissa Harris-Perry on today's MHP. Presidential politics, Pigford, and public schools. Is President Obama having the second-term blues? Is the Pigford settlement with black farmers being manipulated? And should creationism be taught in Louisiana schools? That is all on Melissa Harris-Perry. She is coming up next, and we will see you right here tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Thanks for getting up.